Do you believe that God is the composer of your life? Weaving together the good, the bad, the indifferent, even the messy aspects of our lives and composing a redeeming masterpiece, right? Do you believe that? See, the Bible from beginning to end is an invitation, an invitation that your life can be a story for the glory of God, that your life can have eternal weight, eternal significance. One of my favorite verses in the whole of the Bible, if you go and you find at the very end of David's life, God sang over him and told David that watching your life was like watching the sunrise. To think that our lives can, can have such impact, be so beautiful that God Almighty looks and says, watching your life was like watching the sunrise. In our passage here, in Acts chapter 23, if you rewind time, you see, when, when Jesus told Paul 20 years prior to leave Jerusalem, it wasn't because God didn't approve of Paul's intent. It was because God wanted to compose a greater masterpiece with Paul's life. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 23. As we continue our walk through the book of Acts, let me reset the scene for us today so you can have it fresh in your mind when we get to the narrative. The Spirit called Paul to Jerusalem, even though the Spirit also warned him that bonds and affliction awaited him. Paul went, trusting that Christ would be honored no matter what. Whether he lived or died, Christ would be honored. While he was in Jerusalem on the final day of a Nazarite vow, he was recognized in the temple. Suddenly a group of men began to shout lies. Here is the man who hates our people, who teaches all around against the law of Moses. And look at him here. He has defiled the temple by bringing Gentiles into it. All lies. The crowd, aware of, of who Paul is, they know Paul's reputation. They see red whenever they see him. And they clutch him and surround him and drag him outside of the temple gate with full intention to beat him to death. 200 soldiers see from overhead and quickly rush down, just trying to stabilize the situation. Courageously, in this moment, Paul finds favor with the commander and is allowed to address the whole crowd there. In doing so, he had longed for this moment for 20 years, and now God had provided. He shares his testimony. He brilliantly connects with his audience, saying, I once stood where you were, but he calls them to repentance. He calls them to stop fighting against God. But the moment that he told them that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth, it will go to the Gentiles, with or without you, they had it. And they shout death threats at him. The commander is still thoroughly confused. So he pulls Paul into the barracks and is ready to interrogate him by flogging. Paul maximizes the impact. He waits till the very last moment as he's already stretched out to say, do you do this to Roman citizens? The commander is taken back. He actually releases Paul, but Paul's going to stay under guard for his own protection. Let's pick up there at the very last verse in chapter 22. Okay, so look at verse 30. 
But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why, that's Paul, had been accused by the Jews, he released him and he ordered the chief priest and all the council to assemble. That's the Sanhedrin. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we declare right now in the depth of our heart that we long to meet with you this morning in your word. Father, that we long for your spirit to teach us, to convict us, to renew our minds, to encourage us, to lift our heads, to call us closer to you. Your word says that if we seek you, we will find you, and we are seeking you right now. Father, please reveal more of yourself to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Paul is now standing before the Sanhedrin. The last time he stood before them, he, was, he had received articles to hunt and persecute Christians. Now he is the one being persecuted. You see, his life has come full circle. As a boy, Paul aspired to one day himself sit on the Sanhedrin. He can still hear his father's voice when he sent him off to school in Jerusalem. Son, I have arranged for you to study underneath the high and prestigious Gamaliel, one of the greatest rabbis. And son, if you do well, you too one day could sit in his seat. Paul was driven, determined, and gifted. He excelled above all of his peers. His father was so proud whenever he would come visit him, he would pat his son on the back and say, son, everyone at home knows how you are excelling. You are representing the family name so well. As Paul closed his eyes at night, he dreamed about having the respect and honor of the Sanhedrin. When they walked through the marketplace, everyone got out of their way. He used to be so in awe, so starstruck. Oddly, now Paul stands before them and they seem so small. Simply men. Paul is graying with age and wrinkled with time, walking with a limp and scars on his back. But he realizes so much has changed in the last 20 years. He no longer ached for the approval of others, especially the Sanhedrin. He no longer craved their power or significance, here he stood free from those chains. Listen to how Paul describes it in Philippians chapter three when he gives this testimony. He's talking about himself. He said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. Okay? He has all the prestige, all the acclaim. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish 
so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him. You see, all of Paul's longings for significance and purpose, they have been found in Christ. Standing before the Sanhedrin, now as a defendant, the most powerful men in all of Israel, and yet they seem so small. Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest, Ananias, a a quick fact right right here, uh, there have been multiple high priests since Paul uh, once knew them, okay? The high priest, Ananias, commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Notably, Jesus experienced the same sort of treatment when standing before the Sanhedrin. The high priest's hypocrisy enrages Paul. Here they are accusing him of violating the law by bringing Gentiles into the temple courtyard, which he didn't do, and yet the high priest violated the rules of the Sanhedrin right there in front of everyone by having him punched in the mouth. Verse 3, then Paul said to them, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit and try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? Now this next part is, is either, okay, because the high priest is not dressed in his usual garments. Now that's probably because they are not in the normal chambers Uh, They are most likely in the temple courtyard because it was an emergency meeting. And as you read through the context, the the Roman commander is standing right behind Paul, uh, which would not be allowed in the Jewish quarters, okay? I'm asking the question, how come Paul doesn't recognize the guy, okay? Uh, So either the high priest is not dressed in his normal garments or Paul is being incredibly sarcastic, in his response, and he's in sense saying, you know what, your actions are so contrary to the way that a high priest should act, I can't even recognize you as the high priest. Okay, verse four, but the bystander said, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul says, I was not aware, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And with that, Paul knows that there is absolutely no way that he is getting a fair hearing on his circumstances. So what does he decide to do? Well, we might as well drop a theological bomb right here in the midst of this situation and just see what happens, right? We might as well press them on the most important issue that is Jesus Christ risen from the dead, But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out to the council, brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, and I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. Now, the majority of the Sanhedrin were Sadducees, okay? That is a... uh, They were the aristocratic class. They were powerful, the most wealthy, the high priest was a part of this group, the Sadducees. Now catch this, they believed in no afterlife. They denied the resurrection and even the spiritual world. You see, all you see is all there is. It was religious naturalists. They even denied God's involvement in everyday life, completely self-sufficient. Their view was that God chose to put them in power. That was the main lens that they viewed through life, and it was their job to hold on to that political and social power at all costs. They were rude, arrogant, power-hungry and quick-tempered. 
In fact, they didn't care one bit about Jesus until it reached the level where there was going to be some political cost to them, and then they had Jesus killed. That's the Sadducees. Most of the Sanhedrin were Sadducees. But the other, let's say third, of the group there were Pharisees. The Pharisees cared deeply about theology. They believed in the afterlife. So Paul's bomb here is to say, guys, I'm on trial for believing in the afterlife and believing that there is such a thing as hope in the resurrection. Now for clarity, they had heard his entire testimony the day before. And when he says that, the whole room erupts in fighting. Now, this is a perfect spot for us to pause this morning and to detail historical facts about Jesus' resurrection. Okay? I want you to catch this scene because Paul is standing before the very council that put Jesus to death and argues with them about the resurrection of Jesus. Church, our hope rests squarely on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I will rise because Jesus rose. If he did not rise, there is no Christianity We are still dead in our sins and we are wasting our time this morning. But beloved, he did rise from the dead. All right, four quick historical facts. These are undeniable. One, everyone saw him die. Everyone saw him. There is no question of his death. Let's pretend for just a second, just a moment, that Jesus didn't die, but rather he recovered from his wounds. Remember, he was scorched and beaten within an inch of his life. Consider the physical state and how long it would have taken him to recover. Who worships someone who's been writhing in pain, unable to walk, a broken, pathetic man, as if risen from the dead? Does that really inspire confidence? No. There's no doubt Jesus died. Everyone saw him die. Number two, the tomb was empty. Everyone knew the location of the tomb, and it was even guarded by Roman soldiers. If the Romans or the Jewish people had Christ's body, would they have not paraded it uh, for everyone to see? They would have immediately if his followers had his body. Why were they willing to risk everything, even die for a lie? Because if they had his body, they knew it was a lie. You do not risk everything for something that you know is a lie. Why wouldn't they have changed facts like that it was the women who first saw the empty tomb and encountered the risen Lord? Remember, at that time, a woman's testimony was not even permissible in court. This was an embarrassing fact. If you are stealing his body, certainly you would change the story to make it a little more culturally relevant than that. Number three. The evidences of Jesus' appearance. Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene and to the group of women, to Peter and to the 12, to more than 500 at one time, to James and then to Paul, to Cleopas on the road to Emmaus. These accounts are not legendary. There wasn't enough time. The accounts are immediate. In fact, there is an early hymn that is written and preserved in our scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, an early hymn about this that was recorded within years of the actual accounts. And when Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8, Paul has the audacity to say, you know what? A lot of those people are still living. 
You can go talk to them. You can go listen to their account. Go ask them. They saw Jesus ri uh, who risen from the dead. And they weren't hallucinations. Why? Because multiple people don't see the same thing in hallucinations. Much less groups, much less 500 people at one time. And number four, how do you explain the massive cultural changes that took place? You see, Christianity exploded right there in Jerusalem where everything took place. Right there. You think about this and compare it to other religions like Islam. Uh, uh, Muhammad gets a vision in a, a secret cave and then goes off elsewhere and begins Islam, okay? Not Christianity, right there where the events occurred, not in secret, out in the open. You are not trusting one man's special revelation in a cave. It's not based on one man, it's based on the entire community witness that completely changed because immediately thousands were willing to suffer persecution, even death for their belief in a crucified, resurrected Messiah. Thousands of Orthodox, Pharisaical Jews instantly changed their theology and worshiped Jesus as God. As God. They change social structures, okay? They consider themselves no longer under the Mosaic law. That is dietary and circumcisions. There arose immediately new ordinances like communion and baptism. And on top of that, how do you explain the conversion of skeptics? Like James, the brother of Jesus, who the scripture says repeatedly did not believe, and then he saw the resurrected Lord. Or Paul, that we've been walking through his account, who was completely opposed, wanted to, with everything in him, stamp out the name of Jesus, and now is willing to lay down his life for Jesus. The reality is, is guys, it takes faith to believe in God, and it takes faith to be an atheist. Belief in the resurrection is not only reasoned faith, God has assured that it is historically reliable. And for 2,000 years, that same Jesus has been changing lives. Just this week in my office, I was sitting with a brand new believer that just got saved, who gave account and testimony that I have lived my life selfishly, I have lived my life sinfully, but I have met Jesus, and it is the greatest thing that I have ever experienced. Friend, that offer is for you too. Jesus is alive. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. There is no other way, no other way to the Father except through him, through his finished work on the cross. In you, not believing in your own dead works, but rather you hitting your knees and declaring, I trust that God, you have sent your son and completed all the work for me. This offer is for you. The realization that in the cross of Christ, the holiness of God and the love of God meet in the greatest truth, the greatest story in the history of the world. It is the deepest longing of your soul. If you do not know him this morning, with everything in me, I beg you, cry out in faith to him right now. After the Sanhedrin erupted in heated debate, the commander stepped in to protect Paul. He didn't know what was gonna happen there. He keeps Paul in protective custody for his own safety. And in verse 11, following that night, Jesus came and stood by Paul and said, take courage, 
For as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. Take courage. Paul, you've done well. In the midst of this chaos, you have witnessed to the masses. You've even stood before the Sanhedrin boldly. Well done, Paul. You walked faithfully in the plan that I actually had from the foundation of the world. And now I will send you to Rome. Remember back several weeks prior how the Spirit called Paul to walk to Jerusalem, go to Jerusalem, bonds and affliction await, but everything was dark. Paul didn't know whether he was gonna live or die. There, There was no clarity in his heart about what was going to happen. Walk by faith, Paul, in that Blindness. I need you to go and I need you to trust me. And he said, okay. And now, kindly and tenderly, on the other side, Jesus comes and assures him, encourages him, says, well done, Paul. Man, you did it. It was magnificent. And he assures him, no longer the the season of walking by blind faith was over. Paul, I'm going to send you to Rome. Well done. Jesus' words and promise that Paul would go to Rome make make the next assassination attempt comical. Right, in verses 12 through 22, you find out that 40 men take an oath not to eat or drink until Paul is dead. But the plot is found out, and Paul is going to be moved secretly in the night to Caesarea. Here's to hoping that those men were men of their word and starved to death. (laughs) I'd like to close with us considering the redemptive grace in Paul's life. He who wants hated the name of Jesus and did everything he could to stamp out that name in Jerusalem and everywhere he went. Now, 20 years later, in God's timing, was allowed to stand before the masses, even the Sanhedrin, and say, guys, you know me. I've walked in your shoes, but I have been changed by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Set free from all the guilt and failures and inadequacies. He stood before them, a battered man, aged well beyond his years, but he stood before them free in the grace of God. God orchestrated the timing and circumstances. And we just read and and pressed into the fact that the beauty of his life coming full circle, that God was writing that story. We need to be reminded of of the eight years that Paul uh, spent in Tarsus in complete isolation behind the scenes. We need to be reminded of the beatings and imprisonment of the dark nights of his soul. The fact that his journey was anything but easy, anything but ideal. But when we get to these moments and see the magnificence of the redemptive grace of God in Paul's life, it should stir our hearts that God gave him beauty for ashes. In a world full of ashes, chaos and division and tragedy, our Savior offers beauty. In your life full of ashes, 
scars and pride and even sinful choices, Jesus offers beauty. He offers to exchange your ashes for beauty. The same Jesus that wrote the story of Paul's life wants to write yours. His word is promised. He is transforming you into the image of his son. He is redeeming your broken years, your lost years, eaten by the Lord. He is redeeming. Beloved, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Are you filled with hope? Guys, this isn't a throwaway feel-good message this morning. Because your ability to fight sin, your ability to walk out of temptation, your ability to choose God over against any sort of selfishness, your ability to step out in faith and to take risk for what God is calling you to is directly tied to your belief that God is working all things for my good. He is writing my story. So if that is not you this morning, I want you to listen to God's call in Isaiah 55. Come, all who are thirsty. Come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come by wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. This is your God crying out to you. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. Beloved, we must hear this call this morning and genuinely search our hearts and ask, do I believe that God is writing the story of my life? That he is not only able, but he is willing to take my good, my bad, my indifferent, even my messiness and turn it all for good. Will you pray with me, our Heavenly Father? We bow before you right now and we do cry out in faith. I believe you. I trust you. You can write my story. I believe that you are a redeeming God. I believe that you can take my sinfulness. I believe that you can take my passivity. I believe that you you can take some of my indifference. And you can use it And teach me all for good. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone here this morning that does not know you, I pray that right now in the depth of their heart they would cry out in faith. I come to you, King Jesus, for you are the lover of my soul. My sin has separated me from you. But I repent. I look to your finished work on the cross and I find life in you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, as our praise team comes and leads us in a final song, 
How do you respond to a message like this? That's my question for you. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you and be a shoulder to cry on or one of encouragement. If you want to use these steps or the stage as an altar, come. Give praise to your God who is worthy. I want us to be real intentional. There, there's a response pad in the pew in front of you. If you need to sit and just, just write, I believe you are writing my story. I believe you will cause it all for good. And you need to write a prayer or a step of faith. Whatever God's spirit has pressed upon your heart this morning, you be obedient. Would you stand?